So Muslim Spain is a time when these religions came together harmoniously. However, we also have points in history when they were not so harmonious. The Crusades are really the first point. So the Crusades were an attempt by Western Europe to gain control over Jerusalem, which was under the Muslims at that point. But on the way to Jerusalem, the Crusaders pillaged many villages, led to the deaths of many Jews and Muslims. It's a dark point in the history of the three religions. Much more recently, however, and much more relevant when we're talking about jihad today are 20th century developments. So when we come to talk about jihad and we have a person who interprets jihad to mean a change somehow in the political structure of the West, whether it's through creating fear, killing innocent people in the West, that person sees his or her role as one that's in self-defense of these events. So in the, la in the late 19th and early 20th century, we have most of the countries that are today referred to as the Middle East under some sort of European power. And the Euro European powers control them politically, economically, socially to a large extent. So when we come to talk about Iraq, for example, in 2003, and the United States entering Iraq with the aid or with um, the British as an ally, to many in the region, they remember the British when they were in Iraq in the 1920s. To them, this looks like a repeat of the same event. The British were in Iraq in the 1920s, and they had to be pushed out. They were supposedly in Iraq, and the European powers were in many parts of the region to lead the countries to independence. But in fact, they didn't really lead the countries to independence, and they had to be pushed out in some shape or form and still control some sort of economic elements there. So to those who believe that attacks in Iraq, in the United States, et cetera, our self-defense are connecting it to these events. The United States, we've also had a role in the Middle East, and we've had a role in the 20th century and continue to have a role today, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, suffice to say, because this is, of course, its own topic with many issues surround it, but suffice to say that for many in the Muslim world, they believe that the United States is supporting Israel and that therefore, and turning a blind eye to what they believe are Palestinian atrocities, and so therefore, again, any attack is self-defense for that. So it's self-defense for the Palestinian children, the Iraqi children, etc. Finally, I wanted to focus a little bit on the current situation. 9-11 I talked about, I can talk about more, but ultimately 9-11 was seen as a struggle against the United States because the United States has had a role in the Muslim world. The Iraq war would be one example of the United States' role in the Muslim world. Afghanistan would be another. And of course we see this today with the situation of Egypt. So notice the situation of Egypt now, right? We have protesters in Liberation Square in the middle of the city calling for democracy. We have the U.S. government in a very uncomfortable situation. On the one hand, we want to promote democracy, and we, this is something that we say all the time. But on the other hand, we want stability in the region. And for those in the square fighting for democracy, they say, what do you mean the United States stands for democracy, but now it's interested in stability in the region, or it's going back and forth between the two? So I give this as an example to say that our role in the region comes across often as ambiguous, if not more problematic than ambiguous. To say that we're over here and we don't understand what's happening here with the Muslim world would be false and somewhat dishonest, right? The United States has had a very direct role in the Muslim world over the past hundred years and a little more. This is the argument of one group of people. And part of the reason that I'm focusing on arguments of people who believe that jihad means this is because this is the most 
sort of visible interpretation of jihad that we see. Unfortunately, when we turn on the news, we don't see the person who the, believes that jihad is volunteering at their local charity. We don't see that person. Occasionally, we see somebody like that, but usually not. Usually, we see some sort of violent act. I have a class assignment where I ask students to look at an event from a U.S. media point of view, European media point of view, and Arab world point of view, and just compare three articles on a particular event. Without fail, the event has to do with violence. Whatever makes it on the news is often something connected with violence. So this is the face of jihad that we often see, not the other faces, the other interpretations of jihad that are much more prominent. A couple of examples that I wanted to give you here from the voices of Muslims themselves about this. This is an image that actually appeared, a cartoon that appeared in many, many Arab newspapers. So this hooded figure that we assume is probably some sort of representation of death has this Arabic word, the tatarruf, extremism, written on his back and has a little child that he's holding. So it's a statement by those from the Muslim world about the fear they have towards extremism. There have been many rallies, many demonstrations that were carried out in the Muslim world saying not in the name of terrorism. This interpretation of jihad is not our interpretation. One element that I wanted to show you, and there are many such groups, but I just wanted to show you one thing because it's easy to see. There is a group called the Council on American Islamic Relations. So this is US based. The Council on American Islamic Relations launched an online petition drive. And this online petition was called Not in the Name of Islam. They collected signatures from Muslims all over the world to help correct misperceptions of Islam and the Islamic stance on religiously motivated terror. So what did this petition say? We, the undersigned Muslims, wish to state clearly that those who commit acts of terror, murder, and cruelty in the name of Islam are not only destroying innocent lives, but are also betraying the values of the faith they claim to represent. No injustice done to Muslims can ever justify the massacre of innocent people, and no act of terror will ever serve the cause of Islam. We repudiate and dissociate ourselves from any Muslim group or individual who commits such brutal and un-Islamic acts. We refuse to allow our faith to be held hostage by the criminal actions of a tiny minority acting outside the teachings of both the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, which is a common phrase that's said in Islam after the mentioning of any prophet's name. As it states in the Quran, O oh, you who believe, stand up firmly for justice as witnesses to God, even if it be against yourselves or your parents or your kin, or whether it be against rich or poor, for God can best protect both. Do not follow any passion, lest you not be just. And if you distort or decline to do justice, verily God is well acquainted with all that you do. This petition is available online and collects millions of signatures all the time. I was just telling Father Haft that often when a violent event occurs where the Muslims were perpetrators, I find out about it first not through the news, but through a condemnation from a group like this. So I get an email, the Council for American Islamic Relations or the Muslim Public Affairs Council, whichever group condemns this act of violence. And I mention this because when I give public lectures, people often say, well, why aren't these actions condemned by Muslims? So this is by moderate mainstream Muslims. So this is an example that they are, but unfortunately this isn't the image of Islam that we get to see on the news. So with that, I'll pause or stop here in terms of the lecture and take your questions. Yes, sir. The name of the group is the Council for American Islamic Relations. So the acronym is CARE, C-A-I-R. Questions can be directly about this or somewhat removed, but not too removed. <laughs> yes, sir. Would, would it not seem that, uh, that uh, those folks, the care type folks, uh, would 
seem to be either in the minority or at least the silent majority. Most of the, it seems like, most of the governing parties, whether it's in, in, in uh, the, 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 the loudest protesters in Egypt or whether it's in Iraq or whether it's in Iran, I guess the other extreme, or even in uh, Saudi Arabia where it's, it's uh, all the way to the king, those seem to be the the stronger voices are the are the more extreme Muslims. Okay. Did everybody hear the question, or should I repeat it? You could hear it. Okay. So th there are two different parts here. The governments, whether it's Egypt or Iraq or Iran, are governments, right? So I'll get back to them in a second. Their voice, by its very nature, is different from the people's. The Groups such as, for example, CARE, are ultimately sending their message out all the time. So it's available online, it's in press releases, it's anywhere that you would be able, you would think of sending information out, it's there. Now what gets actually aired, what gets published, that's a different story. And unfortunately, you know, I mean, when it bleeds, it leads. Right? I mean, when a story has more excitement around it, then it unfortunately makes front page news. And when it doesn't seem as exciting, then it doesn't. And that's part of it. Now, when it comes to the governments, governments by their very nature have louder voices than people. Right? You and I can sit and debate here, but our voices won't be on the media the way that Barack Obama's voice will be on the media. And that's just naturally the way of the world, unfortunately. And so as a result, these governments are very disparate in their points of view. They're very divergent. The Egyptian government, for example, is a very differently structured government from the Iranian government. The Iranian government is a theocracy. It has elections that follow a certain pattern. The Egyptian government, which is mainly, mainly secular, is actually a dictatorship and has a very different set of rules, and most of them right now are suspended because there's a state of emergency in Egypt, not because of current events, but that has been going on since 1967. And so as a result, these governments don't represent Islam, they represent themselves. If, for example, I had we turned on the news, so I'll avoid the example of Obama because there's been so much controversy about his religious views, but let's say I was watching on the news Bill Clinton, and Clinton said something. I wouldn't say that Clinton is speaking as a Christian. I would think that Clinton is speaking as president of the United States when he was president. And the same thing goes here. Mubarak isn't speaking as a Muslim. Mubarak is speaking as president of Egypt. The Iraqi government, depending on who's in and who's out at various points, also each person is speaking as himself for his party, for his views. So in terms of what they're going to say, we assume representation about other groups in ways that we don't feel about ourselves. You and I don't feel that every time somebody who's American does something, we should come in and say something about it. But somehow, when it comes to the Muslim world, we expect these figures and these groups to be representative, and ultimately they're not. They're representative of their countries, their governments, their parties, etc. So that's in terms of the government part. In terms of these advocacy groups such as CARE, then unfortunately what happens is that they get the message out, but that's not what makes it to the news.